EP Magazine presents Layla Tamimi and her uplifting story. From suffering a debilitating perilous and stroke to graduating this past January with honors from Montclair State University. In addition, we focus on vision, hearing, speech, and how these impact the development and education of people with special needs. Read it today at www.epmagazine.com. Oscar Mike Radio is a proud podcast partner of Reads Across America Radio. Heard every Thursday at 11 a.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern. They're also big supporters of the nonprofit I Got Your Six, Two Lives at Once. And with every wreath you sponsor through Oscar Mike Radio, $5 goes back to this great organization dedicated to making a difference in the lives of veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders battling PTSD. Two Lives at Once pairs these brave men and women together with dogs rescued from kill shelters. In this way, two lives are saved at the same time by saving each other. Donate now. Go to wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio to help. That's wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio. Suicide is preventable, and each of us has a role to play in suicide prevention. Suicide is complex. There is no single cause, and it's not always a mental health issue. It could be loss of a job or home, financial or relationship issues, pain, or leaving the military. Suicide does not discriminate. It affects all ages, races, and genders, veterans or not. If you know a veteran who is struggling, connect with them. Let them know help is available. There is quick and easy access to services in times of crisis. Dial 988, then press 1. Talking about it is okay. Don't keep it inside. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. Hello and welcome again to Oscar Mike Radio number 401. That's right, number 401. And for every like 101, 201, et cetera, I like to start off with a bang, you know, something new and different. And this is about as new and different as it gets. Yes, I am wearing a tiara with no tape, no nothing. I had to make perfect posture alignment for the entire segment. Some beauty coach out there who does like pageants is going to look at her class and say, look at that. If he can do it, you can do it. And of course, it's a woman, you know, helping me, pushing me to be better than I possibly thought I could be right out of the gate for number 401. Um, Ann Lutz, U.S. Air Force veteran, rocket scientist, veterans advocate, women's advocate, talented into sports, into everything, and knows how to treat a, a host. Welcome to Oscar Mike Radio. Hi, thank you for having me. You look amazing. Well, Doesn't everybody agree? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure people are like, no way. He, he, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to own this, man. I'm going to do it. She sent Biscuitito cookies from Garcia's in New Mexico. And Garcia's, if you're watching this, I might ride my motorcycle out to Mexico just to get some cookies because they're that good. And you have to understand, Anne, I am an oatmeal raisin freak, you know, peanut butter oatmeal raisin freak. But this may be my newest obsession because those were fire. Those were absolutely like my whole world changed. So thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, thanks to Garcia. It's like they, there's so many different types of bizcochitos out there. I think that's the one that's loaded with the most sugar. So Had there you be. go. <laughs> Had to be. But you're joining yeah. <laughs> us today. There's there's so much we can talk about. You have an amazing story. And in a way, you're not just a veteran. You're you're an American success story. But you're, you're going to, and we're starting off 401 with a tiara, with the sash that says, Podcast King. I was very very humbled by that. Thank you very much. But you're going to, you know, show us some of your talents too. You, you kind of threw me for a loop and you're going to, you're going to like sing for me. Yes. And, and for the audience too. So I, uh, <clears throat> a disclaimer, I'm an engineer against domestic violence. So if I break your window doing this, then it's not my fault. So, right. um, so we're going to go non-conventional and I'm going to start off with a song. So, um, yeah, let's let's do this. So this is a song by Julia Cole, just an amazing uh, uh, artist, and she doesn't get enough um, recognition. And and I heard this song. It's called "This Ring." So you could tell as I sing along, it's about a not very healthy relationship. So here we go. See if I could do it some justice. This little piece of gold. Is already feeling dull, and it ain't the thing. It's getting old. Haven't picked a day, haven't picked a place. We're just picking fights, slamming doors. It's gonna kill me either way, I guess. But which one is gonna break my heart less? What if when I leave, he'll become the man I need? Just in time to find some other girl who gets you on one knee. But what if when I stay, I be say I do, and things don't change, and all the hurt I'm hurting now just stays the same? There's no way to know. Yeah, that's the thing. Do I take your last name? Take off this ring. Make a dozen highs. Trade and sleep to cry. Another round. And around we go. Forever feels so hard before it even starts. The highlight of my life ain't supposed to feel this low. But what if when I leave, you become the man I need? Just in time to find some other girl who gets you on one knee. But what if when I stay, we say I do when things don't change and all the hurt I'm hurting now just stays the same? There's no way to know. Yeah, that's the thing. Do I take your last name? Take off this ring. It's gonna kill me the way I guess. Which one is gonna break my heart less? What if when I leave, you become the man I need? Just in time to find some other girl who gets you on one knee. But what if when I stay, we say I do, and things don't change, and all the hurt I'm hurting now just stays the same? There's no way to know. Yeah, that's the thing. Do I take your last name? Take off this ring. Wow. Heavy. I mean, huh? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, really heavy, really on the yeah. spectrum yeah. of, so of, that's of different a song. emotions. Yeah, that's a song about, you know, I guess a couple who is not having a very healthy relationship. So that leads into my 
platform, which is Engineers Against Domestic Violence. So we'll, we'll start with that first and then go into your Air Force and Miss Veteran America. You know, where did that where did that focus with engineers specifically against domestic violence come from, Anne? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to Royal Productions Pageant by NM and Natasha as their CEO. Um, so the as Miss New Mexico America Select veteran, um, you know, it, it, and it's a it's a long title. Um, it's it's a different pageant from what I did before. Um, in the platform that everybody um, from Royal Productions is uh, focused on is on domestic violence. So it doesn't affect just veterans. It doesn't affect just women. It's not exclusive to, you know, to just one population. It's a worldwide issue, um, men, women, you know, and I think even more for men, like a, a good friend of mine, he was in a relationship, his second wife where she was the one beating him up. And he said, look, if I call law enforcement, the blame is always going to be on the dude, right? Yeah. So he, you know, he got out of that relationship and found a much healthier relationship. And he's been married now for so many years and they have an adopted daughter. So that's a good news story for somebody to get out of that relationship. Um, so it affects everybody, not just veterans, and it's such an important issue. So as an engineer, I decide I'm just going to say, you know, my platform is Engineers Against Domestic Violence. You start this platform, and it's central to what you do. And you're also a parent, too. There's not any balance here with you. You are all in on this aspect of domestic violence and its scourge in society. I'm going to ask the obvious question right up front is, what do you think the answer is to reducing uh, domestic violence across the board, Anne? Oh, man. I, I really think it starts in the home. Like for me, I personally never had um, experienced myself being in a relationship where there was domestic violence um, or there is domestic violence. Uh, my parents, they have such a strong relationship. So I am so fortunate in the fact that, um, you know, I grew up in a in a environment where I saw healthy relationships, my aunts, my uncles, my parents. Um, but I was very aware of, you know, one of my friends got pregnant as a teenager and uh, she's no longer with this guy, thank God. But he um, abused her. He would beat her up and she was only 19. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, you know, nobody deserves that. Um, and to reduce that, um, I really think it starts in the home. I mean, like the UFC fighter, um, Sean Strickland was in a podcast and I was shocked to hear that when he was a child, um, his dad was beating up on his mother and he bashed a guitar over his dad's head and then called the cops and his dad was in jail, but his mother bailed, you know, her husband out of jail. And it's like, why? And so there's that codependency. There's no, there's no straight answer to that. Unfortunately, I, I you know, Travis, I, I think um, it starts in the home. And then if somebody has good self-esteem, they've, they have a good job that, you know, they know they can support themselves and they can leave a relationship um, if it's too toxic. You know, and sometimes it's tough. Sometimes you might have everything in place, but for whatever reason, you have that codepend codependency um, in an otherwise like unhealthy relationship. So there's so many factors that play into that. It could be cultural. But at the end of the day, we know that that's not right. We know that any type of domestic abuse is not, it isn't, you know, you are worthy. If you are a domestic um, abuse victim, um, I, I do want to point out that there's like the 800 number that you can call. It's a national domestic abuse hotline number. Um, and if you're in immediate danger, you know, definitely call 911. And so just to kind of bring that to our attention, I'll go ahead and 
and say it now, the 800 number is, um, it's the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-7233. Again, 1-800-799-7233. And, and so and, unfortunately, and, uh, and, yeah, and, go ahead. And, and I'll, I'll put that in the Oscar Mike Radio uh, website post for this. Absolutely, so, you, thank you. Know, you. People read this and can call right away. Um, you get started with engineers against domestic violence now let's just say you know I'm suffering. I'm a guy. I'm suffering. And 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 to your point, you know some of the guys that I know that you know get beat on by their their wives have a real hard time with this. And the same thing for women making that jump to say, you know what, I'm done. So what can you do if you're a family member or a friend and you're watching what's going on? You know what to look for, and you're seeing your friend or your your family member, you know, suffering with this, but it's, it's not your choice, but you want to help. What do you do? I think the best thing to do is ask them how they are doing and listen to them. And then, you know, getting a plan together. Um, so for example, if they don't have a bank account of their own, um, they need to set up an account where nobody else has access, right? Because, you got to have some form of, um, I guess, agnes to, to be able to escape, to be able to make it on your own. Um, and so uh, listening to them, but then giving them the resources. Like, so just FYI for the show, we're, we're not service providers, but when I started to learn about domestic violence and where victims can go for help, what numbers they can call, you know, if you're in immediate danger, then definitely call 911. Um, if you look at some of the domestic violence help websites, you know, they have a little button that you can push where let's say your abuser might be looking over your shoulder. They might be like stalking you and then you can press that button. So it kind of takes you to like the weather. And it's sad that websites have to be designed that way for domestic violence um, victims, because then it doesn't look like they're, I guess, searching for help because that actually might put them in danger depending on how severe the other, you know, yeah, yeah. the abuser is. So it's sad that, you know, but I think there's that understanding that there's that button for just, you know, um, for, for making it look like you're looking at just generic stuff versus really searching for help. Like, where do you go for help? In New Mexico, um, near Santa Fe, there's, um, you know, some shelters. And, uh, I, you know, I guess what I could do is send out a list throughout the state of New Mexico where people can go for help because I don't want to just favor one over the other because there's so many out there. Um but I know like, I know like the VA started to um, have uh, programs and questions that are in place for providers to ask, you know, at least for veterans. And I, I, it makes me wonder if that's going to translate to the civilian healthcare system. Um, because, you know, if you've been to urgent care lately, if you've been to um, a hospital lately, they always ask besides taking your vitals, like, Hey, do you feel safe at home? Sure. So I don't know if you, you notice that. Um, so that's like a part of a screening process. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's always good to talk about the uncomfortable things and, and again, hopefully, um, that 800 number. And again, I'll, I'll say it here. It's 1-800-799-7233. That's a National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-7233. Now they are like, I was doing some research and it said that they might be, there might be a wait time or there might be um, a backlog. It, it shows that people are using that service, but it also tells us that there's such a need for that type of, of helpline or hotline. Um, and I guess it spiked a lot during COVID, you know, for obvious yeah. reasons. So speaking of COVID, <laughs> um, I, I actually tested positive again my second time having COVID. So it just goes to show that being a veteran with all those 
jabs that we get in the military, we're still alive. We're still here. So <laughs> um, we can still hit those high notes without breaking windows, I, I guess. So um, now, now you so say it's, it's, it, you say engineers against domestic violence. Are you doing this with a group of other engineers, male and female? Are you doing this alone? How, how does your how does this work? So for me, I just wanted um, a very simple platform and I figured engineers against domestic violence okay. um, because I am one and, and, you know, with the STEM movement in our country, which is a huge national security issue, um, there's more STEM jobs out there than there are people applying for them who are U.S. citizens and who pledge allegiance to the United States of America. So um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's different because when you think of an engineer, like, you know, what didn't people normally think of, right. When they, when they see the word engineer, um, and because I am one, I figured I'll just keep it simple and just say engineers against domestic violence. And, and, um, it's not a group. I think it's more of a, let's just start with me. Let's just start with one person yeah. because, um, I'm just grateful that, there are organizations out there like pageants, like competitions that allow for people to pick one platform and then be able to, to share it with the rest of, you know, society to say, you know, th this is the reason why I'm stepping up to do, you know, yeah, it's a pageant, but it also opens up doors for networking. It also opens up doors for talking about uncomfortable issues um and domestic violence is definitely not you know for the faint of heart oh, of course not of course not i'm just curious though did did you start going down this road while you were still in the air force or was this before the air force and then when you got out you were able to devote um your time to this you know yeah <laughs> and kudos to you for trying to keep that on the whole time um, so I, so I, um, I started out at the Merchant Marine Academy, Kings Point, New York, and we're only a D3 school, division three school. Uh, my parents had four kids and I was the oldest of four. So for me, I'm like, man, how, how am I going to go to college without working myself to death? Right. Cause you know, I was the oldest of four kids and my parents, you know, they weren't like, you know, rich or anything. Um, they worked hard and, and I wanted to, to make them proud. So I don't know what birth order you're in, or if you have I'm a lot of oldest. brothers, I, I, you're I'm the, the oldest. Old, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, it's, it's lonely, isn't it? And being the oldest. Eh, I mean, yes and no, because I think it's more annoying because they want you to always set the example as the oldest. Well, you're just, uh, uh, come you on. know, the first, the first <laughs> lie your parents tell you as the oldest is, don't you understand your younger siblings look up to you and admire you? And meanwhile, your younger siblings are, are laughing at you behind your back. And then, I don't know about you, by the time <laughs> they get to the youngest one, all the stuff that you had to go through and, you know, they really clamped down on you and made you do this, made you that. Oh, honey, it's okay. I know I made you go through all this stuff, but they're the youngest. It'll be okay. I mean, it's not fair, Anne, at best. <laughs> it's so not fair. Right? Yeah. No. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think being a girl is even worse because my brothers never had a curfew. But after I graduated from a freaking federal institution, I call it, they still gave me a curfew because I had a few months before my orders for the Air Force, right? So I come home and I get like this this job at the mall just to like stay busy until I reported to my first duty station. And they still gave me a curfew. I'm like, W, you know, whiskey tango foxtrot over. And so I that for me, I love my parents. Like they're amazing people. And I get it. Like they're worried, they do that out of love. And I guess it's like an Asian thing. Um, but I was like so ready to start my career in the Air Force. So so you actually you asked, okay, did this whole pageant thing, this whole platform thing start before or after? 
Um, it definitely after I, I spent 20 years active duty and, um, you know, put in, actually was in Afghanistan, um, missed my daughter's second birthday. And I, I remembered a buddy of mine told me, uh, the same one that actually got abused by wife number two. And he's like, Hey, don't forget, you got to ask the air force mother, may I permission to retire? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, um, you gotta like go to that personnel site and at your 19 year point, you know, when you know, or one year before, you know, you're eligible to retire so you can get your orders to retire. So you could PCS one more time on the government's dime. And I'm like, I didn't know that dude. So thanks. So I was in Afghanistan and I'm like, I got one more year until I hit my 20, you know, just make it home alive. Right. And we were in that we were in that unit where we lost the two-star general, uh, Major oh, wow. General Harold Green. So if you look him up, he's I, like the only two-star general, like the highest ranking officer since Vietnam who who died um, from a green on blue attack. And he was an amaz amazing leader, amazing engineer. Um, the Army has an acquisition award in, in his name, in his honor. Um, and then like four months later, we lost to her. So not only do we, do we, lo did we lose our two-star general, we lost our command sergeant major. So I'm Air Force, but we worked with Army. We worked, we had two Marines in our unit. Um, so yeah, within four months, and we weren't even a, in a combat unit. We were just engineering logistics support, you know, and, but we went outside the wire and we conducted meetings with our Afghan counterparts and build trust and rapport. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so we lost our command sergeant major, like, I want to say a few days before Thanksgiving. Um, and then I just remembered, like, what the hell happened, you know? So the green on blue attack killed our two star and then the, an IED took out our command sergeant major and his driver. And that was just days before. And he had given me crap about not wearing the right, you know, you know, command sergeant majors. He's like, hey, uh you know, you got on the wrong cold weather gear. And I'm like, I know, I know command sergeant major. major. I'm, I'm, And that was like the day before I was on a plane to go to Bagram to go home via, you know, Germany. And then, uh, so he, he, like right up until that last day, he, he always found something wrong. And I just was like, man, you know, when I, when I heard about what happened, um, you know, there's just so many things to be thankful for sure. and we didn't want them to die in vain. And so, uh, it, you know, a lot of the things that I learned in the air force, I applied today in my current job as an engineer and, um, you know, this whole pageant thing came about, um, I competed in the Ms. Veteran America competition. It's not a pageant. That one is not a pageant. It's a competition. Um, no, wait, there's a difference. Finals... No, 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 educate me here. There's a difference between pageant and competition. Aren't they the well, same I thing? Think, yeah, well, you know, it depends on, it depends on the, uh, the organization, right? Oh, okay. It depends on the president, founder, CEO of a particular organization. I think the Miss America, um, I guess pageant now called competition, um, the current reigning Miss America. She's the second lieutenant, uh, Madison Marsh Air Force. Um, and so that used to be called a pageant. And now I think they call it a competition. I, I think when people look at, when people associate pageant, they think, you know, you know um, just beauty and nothing else. Right. But a lot of people do it for so many reasons, like scholarship is one of them, uh, scholarship money, or just prize money that you could save up um there's also like the platform right so um i've you know for me it was a way to connect it, this was 2022 when i first competed and i mean today i'm 50 years old you know why why am i doing this right so i have a daughter and hopefully it'll introduce her to pageants as a way to for scholarship money because you know, I don't expect her to go to a federal institution, a federal academy, unless she wants to. Like, I wanted to go to the Merchant Marine Academy. I knew 
that that was an avenue to get a commission in any of the armed services. So if you look up usmma.edu, United States Merchant Marine Academy.edu, Kings Point, New York, we're only Division Three school, but we beat Coast Guard every year um, in when we play against them uh, in football. So um, it's a, it's a well kept secret, and it has an amazing engineering curriculum. Uh, so Kings Point, New York, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Um, I ran track and cross country when I was there. They were like, oh, you played violin. We'll stick you in the band. And I'm like, what? So, you know, there's no string instruments in a band. So then I'm like, what, what am I doing here? And then I figured I'm going to I'm going to learn how to play snare drum. So I picked up, you know, uh, percussion and we ended up marching in the inaugural parade in Washington, D.C. So that was really cool. Um, and then. Uh, you know, 20 years later, I uh, retired from the Air Force. How was, it, how, and, was it, how was it like getting out? When you, you do 20 years in the Air Force at a right. high level, you, re, you retire. What, some officers tell me different things. I'm curious what your experience is like. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like I said, um, unconventional, right? So I was like, at the time I was, I was married, um, and, and, you know, my husband, my ex-husband, he's an amazing father. So I'm so grateful that we can co-parent because that's not for the faint of heart. So we're we're kicking ass at co-parenting and, and we let our daughter know, like, she's our number one. Um, things didn't work out after 18 years, you know, and that's okay because I met a few other folks who, who also after 18, 19, 20 years of marriage was like, man, you too? So... It, it made me feel like I wasn't alone. But for me, um, the reason why I moved, I was at Los Angeles Air Force Base. And I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't want to stay in California. It's a great place to visit. Just don't want to live there. Right. Um, so this was 2015. And so at the time, my ex-husband found work um, in New Mexico. So I said, OK, yeah, you know, I was stationed there. That's where we met when I was um, stationed there in the 90s. Um, so they, they joke like New Mexico is the land of enchantment, but we also know that it's also the land of entrapment. So once you're there, you know, you'll come back. And so that's what happened. I'm a Virginia girl. I grew up mostly in Northern Virginia near Washington, DC. So I'm kind of like an implant to the state of New Mexico, but it's become my home. And, um, you know, I wasn't working. So like, what do I do? Like, what do I do? So uh, even with uh, bad knees and a bad back, um, I'm like, you know, I maybe I'll take a break from working a job or I'm sorry, a desk job um, to like, I'm going to teach kids how to snowboard and ski, right? Like you don't get paid much, you know, most of the time. Yeah. You know, I always, if I put my daughter in, in ski or snowboard school, I always tip the instructor and but you know as as an instructor myself like I I don't expect that right you just you just don't um because at the end of the day you're making a difference in some kid's life and um it's it's bonus if if you you know if you get like a tip from the parents but for me I'm like you know this is great because it gives me a chance to be outdoors it's a way to heal Right. And it actually was better for my back and better for my knees because I wasn't sitting down all day. Um, and I, I'd rather pick up a crying child than a crying adult, because, you know, if you teach if you teach adults at a ski or snowboard, that could be a little traumatic. Um, so I figured, OK, that that'll be a great, you know, a great job. And for me, it's, you know, put the ego aside. I, it wasn't getting paid a lot at all, but, you know, I learned about the outdoor industry. Um, I actually worked for REI for a few months and I learned about the outdoor industry. I learned about, you know, um, customer service and it was different. Um, and so, I don't know, I think one of the things that I, domestic violence, right. And, or, or unhealthy relationships, right. So, one of the things that I observed as an REI employee was I, I was ringing somebody, I was up at the cash register and one of my coworkers was like, Hey, Anne, I really, I can't, I can't ring up this couple. 
can, can you ring them up for me? And I didn't know this couple from Adam. Right. And I'm like, yeah, sure. No, no worries. You know, let's take care of them. Um, and I talked to my coworker later about it, but I observed, you know, we're like, yeah, you know, it's a one and done. I, I guess it was $20 back then. I don't know what it is now, but if you become an REI member, you get all these coupons every year. So it really pays back and more the cat is jumping all over the place. Um, but anyway, unhealthy relationships and domestic violence. So as I was ringing up this couple, I was telling them about memberships because I guess apparently the, the boyfriend had a membership, but the girlfriend didn't. And I, you know, was just doing my job telling them about this. And then she realized something. She was like, you mean the whole time I was giving away, like every time I bought something from the store, my boyfriend would be getting like points from me, you know, using his membership. So she was like, here, I'm, here's my 20. I want my own membership. And he was like, what are you doing? She goes, no, it's only 20 bucks, man. I want my own membership. And I think it gave her like the light bulb came on and it just gave her that independence that she needed. Um, and, and then, you know, they, they paid for their stuff. She got her membership. She left. And then I turned to my coworker and I'm like, you know, man, what, what just happened? And it's like, I didn't mean to cause like a dispute between the couple, but I guess apparently she finally realized like this dude was like taking advantage of her and she's like, she's her own woman, you know? And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, Ooh, that's another example of a very unhealthy relationship. And even my coworkers are like, yeah, I, every time that couple comes in, I just can't, I just can't ring them up. And so it, it really, I don't know. It just opened my eyes to just um, observing, um, you know, just subtle things like that. And then realizing like, man, I've got a daughter and I want her to, to know that like, she could study engineering, she could study whatever, but just like at the end of the day, be able to support yourself, be able to know the difference between a healthy relationship and unhealthy relationship and to be able to like make a plan to get out of one. Um, and then of course, when I was teaching kids how to snowboard and ski and helping them wipe snot off their face. I mean, not a very glamorous job, you know, after being in Af Iraq and Afghanistan and defeating the enemy and all that, you know, you're, you're down to like, just like, you know, holding a kid's gloves underneath the heating device in the bathroom during lunch to make sure that their gloves aren't, you know, freezing their little hands. So it was very humbling, you know, but at the same time, I was able to learn all of, the instructors, like who they were, their names, because when I put my kid into um, their ski school, then I knew who all the instructors were and then they knew me. And so, um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I was interviewing for a desk job again, a professional job again, every job is professional. Um, and then I started to work you know, in project management, again, in engineering, project management, IT. So that was, you know, I was back into the, the office setting, uh, making, you know, making good money. But I, I, I learned a lot more when I'm working like, I, I guess, almost minimum wage jobs. And, you know, for me, it's like, it's still money. It's food, you know, money for food to, to be able to put food on the table and, you know, to be able to get fresh fresh mountain air and be out there and, and, um, just learn something new. You know, it's, I know a lot of retired officers, they probably don't want to take anything less than, but for me, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, this for, this is for me. This is my time now. This is, I get to be outside. I get to snowboard for free. I get to ski for free. Um, you know, so, it's, so you'd it's rather been be, a blessing. You'd rather be in nature and outside on your own terms and chained to a desk. Looking, yeah, I mean, looking it's, at project plans, making sure yeah. the, making sure the you know phase gates are all set. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an outlet. Yeah. It's an outlet. I mean, so for me, an, it was. You, you still know, enjoy it's healing. Do you still enjoy the discipline of engineering, and but just like being outside, or is engineering kind of in the back? 
rearview mirror now because you're patented. You, you put a lot of effort into this, Anne. Uh, no, I mean, I'm like, so I'm working full time okay. as an engineer and I'm also taking um, well, only one class at a time uh, working on my PhD <laughs> and I'm enrolled in air war college. But for me, like I was telling my bosses because they probably think I'm crazy for like taking on all of this. Right. But I'm like, bosses, you know, this is what I thrive on. Like, like it, it gets my brain to think. And, and I think the reason why I, I do these pageants, I do these competitions is sometimes I got to get out of my own head and help somebody because when you help um, others, it'll actually be healing for you, right? You get out of your own head space. You just, you meet new people. Um, and then if you have a purpose in getting up, like, you know, with, I have COVID now, it's like the second time I've had it since 2022. And it, man, it was rough, man, getting up this morning. But that's why when you were um, sending me messages to say, hey, can we move the time? You probably heard from me and then didn't hear from me for like an hour because I like, I just laid back down. I just, I just had to, you know, like we I was working move while this. I was we, sick. We, did, we didn't have to do this today. <laughs> no, no, this, this is, this is keeping me going, man. This is like, I so appreciate, uh, I, I'm grateful that, that you're able to, to do this today. Cause I'm like, and this tells people too, like, just cause you got COVID, you know, doesn't mean in it. If you're strong, if you're healthy to begin with, then you can kick its ass. So, you know, it's, it's just to prove like to whoever's watching, if you get sick with this, with this virus, like, it, you know, stay healthy, um, stay away from alcohol. <laughs> this is water. And, uh, well, but, I mean, I, mean, uh, I, mean I, don't, I don't know what, what they were told you in the Air Force, uh, and, but we were told in the Marine Corps from the, a gallon of water a day won't get sick. So I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I was told. And by the way, did you did you yeah. ever go through Barksdale Air Force Base by any chance? Uh, twice. I've been to Barksdale. Okay. Well, I, I joined the Marine Corps out of Shreveport, Bossier, and that was one of the things, like, there was an Air Force Base right there. I could have been stationed right in Barksdale, but no, I joined the Marine Corps. It was kind of funny. When I went yeah. to Andrews Air Force Base in California, and we're all like, this is how the Air Force does it? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. Like I was in Iraq and I was, I mean, to be honest with you, the third, well, they took the word armored out of like third armored cavalry, because I think the assumption is if you're cavalry, you're, you're armored, <laughs> you're armed. Um, but at the time, this was 2007, 2008, when I was in Mosul, Iraq, and that was during the surge. And the third ACR, the brave rifles were there and they took better care of me than, I mean, I was like the lone Air Force puke. I was doing quality assurance and nothing like what I did in Afghanistan. But, um, you know, I think the army took better care of me. Like, you know, we weren't there for a wall-to-wall -wall carp reading. We, you know, we were in a war zone, like, come on. But I was fortunate to be issued a, like my own, um, believe it or not, it was a Chevy, uh, anyway, drawing a blank. I had to have my own vehicle because we would go from fob to fob to, to just make sure that the contractors do, were doing what they were supposed to be doing and not just pencil whipping like, oh, did you check your generator? Did you make sure the oil was, the oil level was okay? Instead of just taking a piece of paper and saying, yep, yep, yep. And, and calling it a day. Right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I think the army, you know, yeah, you might be air force, but at the time for me, the army really took care of me better than I guess, you know, the air force did at the time. What, what, so, what, I've, what I've understood is in the air force, it's the pilots first aircraft second and everything else is a distant third. And I mean, distant third. Yeah. Well, I no, I, so as an aircraft mate, maintainer like or maintenance officer really uh, I did that for career branding it, it is yes I mean there's the rated um the operators or it's a rated air force they say I mean it is the air force right where uh the mission is to fly fight and win air power anytime anywhere so of course 
um, you know, you can't fly an airplane without the pilots, but you can't also fly the plane without the maintenance. So for me to see firsthand um, on the flight line and being able to take care of our airmen, like I had some amazing senior NCOs um, and, and really, you know, so we had a chief master sergeant and E9, well, a real chief um, and a senior master sergeant, and four master sergeants, and they were just really trustworthy senior NCOs. And the best advice that any young officer can get is, you know, find yourself a trustworthy senior NCO, latch on to them, learn from them, take care of your, you know, in your case, take care of your Marines, in my case, take care of the airmen. And I trusted them and I'm retired now, so I could say whatever, right? So I, I trusted my senior NCOs more than I trusted my fellow officers. And uh, <laughs> I can't believe you're going to keep that on the entire the whole, show. The whole, the whole show, Anne. <laughs> That's halfway I don't here. Even, I don't even have my crown and sash on, but, um, you know, you, you could see it in some of the photos that I posted. Um, so... Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, these senior NCOs were amazing, and I learned a lot from from them. Um, they really did look out for our airmen. I mean, I had to drive. I, I don't. So another thing I think that kept me out of trouble, that kept me in healthy relationships, or at least, you know, um, just kept me out of trouble in general, is I never really picked up. I never, I never really cared to. And I tell my daughter this. Um, to drink like alcohol <laughs> and i can tell you from my marine corps time i didn't drink in the marine corps mm. it's a personal decision why i don't drink but everything every time one of my fellow buddies got in trouble alcohol was the, the catalyst man and i'm like you know i'm not missing anything it really and and you know you're an officer but I, it just ruined careers at, at launch Oh yeah. I mean, I, so I had to drive a fellow air force officer home. Well, not really home, but to our buddy's house. Like we had a birthday party for one of our friends. And I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I knew he was a captain at the time. And I like, I knew his wife, his kids, his kids were teenagers and had a little bit too much or a lot to drink that night. <clears throat> so um, and, and I could tell like he had a really healthy relationship with his wife and, and kids. And I'm like, dude, man, you're not driving. Like we got, you need to spend the night at, at, um, our buddy's house because like you can't, you're not going to drive. So, but he goes, well, I need you, <clears throat> you know, I'll pay for the taxi. We'll come, we'll get my car so I could park it near you know I could park it at the house where he was gonna stay that night and so I said okay let's let's get the cab let's you know you got to be a good wingman I guess for for your buddies and so I'm like dude man this is your career like you don't want to mess that up like I know your wife I know your kids but you need to call your wife and tell her that you're gonna spend the night at Matt's house you know um my friend Matt from Alabama and he like, um, and this, this wasn't Matt, this was another, another friend, but it, we were celebrating Matt's birthday. And so I'm like, dude, I, you know, no, no, no. So we went and got his car. He's like, Hey, by the way, do you know how to drive stick shift? And I'm like, yeah. So that's the number one thing is you never know when you're going to use that, right. Use that skill. It's also an anti-theft device, especially if you live in Albuquerque. <laughs> so, um, and, and then we actually drove up armored SUVs in Afghanistan. Um, and they were all, guess what? They were all manual. Um, and I had to drive a few times, believe it or not. So as an engineer, you might become a driver in Afghanistan. You just never know, right? <clears throat> so we get in the cab and we get to his car and, you know, I'm driving his car and everything and made sure he got to, you know, our friend Matt's house so he could just spend the night there, dropped him off. I said, okay, call your wife, let her know where you are. <laughs> and then I, and then I left and I drove an hour and a half to get back home where I was living in California at the time. So 
yeah, it's just, I, I'm like, man, these are the people I work with, you know, and these, you know, it, it doesn't matter what rank you are. It doesn't matter, you know, like people, people do silly things when they party. And so, you know, you gotta be like, sometimes you have that one friend in, in the group who is always going to be the DD. You have like the one friend who's going to be like the responsible that was, one. That was you me. Know? You know? Yeah. I guess that shows why you, know, you were the oldest and it's like, you know, being the oldest, like we get it. Like we have to be the responsible one and that's okay because I'd rather be sober and, and be aware of my surroundings, right. Situational awareness. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's uh, the, the same yeah. way. And I found over time, I don't need alcohol to have a good time. Just fine. exactly. And you can see, you can see exactly and understand and remember, yeah. you know, what, what went on. Um, but you know, the, I, I was reading about the six types of, um, you know, domestic uh, violence and there's like, man, there's, it's crazy. Like number one, well, not, not in any particular order, but one of the six types of domestic violence is digital or online abuse, including monitoring and so-called revenge porn. And number two out of six, Again, not in any really particular orders, financial or economic abuse. Number three out of six is emotional and verbal abuse, including belittling insults and manipulation. What are we up to now? Number four out of six is psychological or mental abuse, including intimidation, isolation, or and stalking, which by the way, as a veteran, I was like, I got to look this up. Like if I'm still active duty, what, what does the UCMJ say about stalking huh. and domestic violence? And there are two different UCMJs, one on stalking and one on domestic violence, but it focuses on like only people closest to the perpetrator. So what if, I don't think there's language in the UCMJ for like stalking and domestic violence for like, um, I guess coworker, I mean, they have training now for, for like workplace violence. Uh, but it was interesting. It was interesting. Uh, so continuing on the list, uh, number five out of six is, you know, the physical abuse, including withholding resources needed to maintain your overall health. And then number six out of six, not in any particular orders, sexual coercion or abuse so man, that's heavy. That's that's a heavy list of six types of domestic violence. But that's you know that's what the that's what's listed here. Um, there's so many good articles out there that talk about it. So 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 uh, into this year and and you know in the future, you know kind of winding this down is where do you see your advocacy going with with this in the future and. You know, long after a pageant is over, long after a competition is over, um, just getting the message out there, just like that 800 number, which I will repeat again, um, it's the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. And uh, let me get to that. Um, it's 1-800-799-7233. Again, 1-800-799-7233. You know, hopefully um that national domestic violence hotline you know, that won't ever change and hopefully they will hire more people um to help if you have to god forbid if you ever have to call that number or 911 if you're in immediate danger um you know what i hope is like people are aware of this like you know pageants come and go um your reigning years come and go but if you're aware of this and later on in life, if you can help somebody, if you can see the warning signs, if you yourself need to get out of an abusive relationship, have a plan, have your own um, bank account, have your own nest egg, have, you know, <clears throat> I guess your own getaway car, make, you know, as an engineer, I am, I guess, obsessed. I, I am um, notorious about making sure like, I think I'm due for an oil change. So thank you for the reminder. Um, make sure your oil is changed. Your tires are rotated. You know, just the simple things of just making sure your car is is squared away. 
because you need it to go to work. You need it to, you know, to go snowboarding, whatever you need to do. Um, hopefully, you know, you need it to drive your friend home from the bar, right? Um, sober. I, and, I, I, I like to think yeah. of it as my term for it is in my line of work is, uh, you know, redundant, con re redundant contingencies. Yeah. So you have multiple contingencies for possible points of failure and each system is redundant on each other. And that's when you've got, that's when you know you've got a good backup plan. No, it's true. Um, I lost my two uncles. So I asked my dad because they escaped Vietnam when I was a child. And um, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a war refugee, you know, I'm, I'm a product of uh, war. And so I'm grateful to be a U.S. citizen. I'm so, so honored to have served in the United States Air Force, serve my country, the country that gave me freedom. And my dad, I said, dad, so what really happened to my two uncles? And one of them died from malaria. And of course, being in Afghanistan, you had to pop those malaria pills and nobody was holding a gun to my head. So I didn't, I didn't even care to take him when I was there. Um, didn't even care to finish my anthrax series of shots when I was in, a, but, but my other uncle, so you talked about um, artificial intelligence in your other, one of your other podcasts. And, you know, I guess autopilot can be considered a type of AI. And I mean, you're talking about late sixties, early seventies when this happened. So my dad was like, yeah, so your other uncle died because he was a passenger in an aircraft where rumor had it that the pilots, um, you know, put the aircraft on autopilot and went to the back of the plane and played cards with the rest of the crew. And I'm like, oh, damn, because it might be able to tell whatever the autopilot was designed to do back in the day might be able to tell your your altitude, but not so much that there's a mountain in front of you. Um, you know, that's where human in the loop is so important. And do you even trust the algorithm? You know, do you even, you know, there, there are, believe it or not, there are AI um, applications out there to help with maybe, and you can look this up because I can talk more about it later or in a future post when you follow my page. But as an engineer, I was intrigued because there's an AI application for, um, I guess, when somebody is in distress and they're calling or texting, because you can also text, but there's nothing that can replace human interaction, like when you call the hotline and, and talk to somebody. But there are AI applications out there that can help um, pick up, I guess, some words from like a, a text message or whatever for, for a domestic abuse um, victim. But, you know, for for me as an engineer and somebody who believes in testing, making sure you test the software algorithm, that you trust it, you verify and validate that this the software algorithm is written properly to for its intended use and it's not hacked into, it's not manipulated and somebody is always double checking it because you know, AI is great, but if you're not checking it to make sure it's doing what it's intended to do and it um, it's causing more harm, uh, then, you know, yeah, as an engineer, you, you got to be leery of those things and you got to ask, well, did you test it? Is there a regression test? Is there, yeah. you know, so there's always that, you know, the engineer in me says, uh, we got to test the hell out of this and, and make sure it works. Um, you know, and, and it makes sure it helps the person, but there's nothing that can replace um, humans, you know, interacting with each other. So what we're doing right now, talking to you, Travis, and hopefully getting the message out there is for somebody who is in, in distress, you know, there's that hotline. And again, I'll repeat it one more time. Um, <clears throat> and it's the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. It's 1-800- uh, 799-7233. Again, 1-800-799-7233. And if you're in immediate danger, call 911 and be safe out there, everybody. And, and, you know, take care of each other and take care of yourselves. Well, I mean, again, folks, you don't have to suffer alone. You don't have to suffer. You can make change where you are. And, you know, one of the things about talking with you, Anne, is this whole aspect that, 
you know, every point in your life you've had to make a decision to make change and you've followed through on that. And you've offered up this resource of people who are suffering in the midst of their own version of hell. They're in the abyss right now, but there's a way out. And, you know, to me, you are the the American military success story. You came to this country, you joined the the Air Force, you served honorably for 20 years, you got out, and you're you're not slowing down yet. In fact, I got tired just listening to everything you got going on. I'm like, wow, I'm I gotta catch up. I'm I'm slow compared to you, but it's really interesting to hear how, you know, veterans find this way to continue to serve. So hopefully you'll come on again. And did I did I sport this right? Did I own this moment? Did I why did you want me in the TR and the podcast sash? <laughs> I gotta ask that to close this out. Did I did I own right. this right? No, you 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 crushed it, brother. Um, the reason why I chose the the color purple to to you know write podcast king, um, you know on your sash is you know purple signifies it. Like you know, there's always a month for this, a day for that. There's a color for certain things, and I guess domestic violence. These organizations that pop up to help. Um, victims of domestic violence abuse, they seem to be using the color purple a lot. And so that's the reason behind it, but you crushed it. And like, you kept your posture, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I've never had anybody coach me in pageantry or anything like that. I probably should, <laughs> but I just don't have time, you know, between work and school and air war college and everything. But, you know, just watching you, I'm like, Oh, I, I need to watch my posture. So you set the example, brother, <laughs> you know, you're, you're that Marine that's crushing the tiara and sash right now. So that's something to be proud it, right? of. <laughs> well, I hope you come back on and talk to me about more about, you know, what you're doing in the engineering yeah. and veteran space. I've learned a whole lot and I hope you have too. And the underlying theme, you know, if I got it right, Anne, is you don't have to suffer. You can make a change anytime you want to. The number she said it multiple times, it's going to be in the Oscar Mike radio website post. Please, please, please get help. But, and I've had a great time talking with you. This is a truly an epic way to start number 401 in the 400 series of uh, OMR show. It's just going to get better and better. Absolutely. And thanks for having me. Thanks, oh, Travis. The hard thing is cool. Well, to St. Oscar Mike Radio, we are Mission and Flight, and Anne is Oscar Mike with what she's doing. And thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Remember, on and teach is our mission. We care about it. We do it every day. But I think there are things that just hit you and give you a reason to go on. The theme for our 2024 for Reads Across America is live with purpose. It just seemed to fit in with the vows of the wreath, the 10 attributes that we feel represent our United States military. And I thought, what a great opportunity to put those two things together and show our kids through how we act some of the things that can make their lives better, their communities better, and by doing that, the country better. For me, live with purpose, I think, is a, it's a mindset. Set some guidelines and then go out and purposefully make life different, make a change. It's an opportunity to set an example. Thank you for listening and watching Oscar Mike Radio, where our active duty service members and veterans are in action and the mission is in flight. Oscar Mike Radio is an oversized load, co to one production. If you are a veteran or know a veteran who needs help, please dial 988 and press 1 for the Veterans Crisis Line.